Okay, class. So the next module, mini module we'll go into is the simple economics of food production. And this is where we ended off the last lecture. So let's think about different production environments. Uh, here we have on the right, we have a typical Canadian scene, uh, you know, a, a picture from the Western producer, which is a major news source for on agriculture in Western Canada. Um, and the, you know, the harvest in with a massive combine into a massive truck, which comes out to the field and may take the grain directly to the buyer. On the left side, we see uh, a group of farmers in Ethiopia who are harvesting teff using incredibly labor intensive practices, practices using a sickle uh, that they may have made very, may very little different from the way they were uh, 2000 years ago. So there's fundamentally different economics. There's much, much, much more labor uh, going into the Ethiopian farm, much, much more capital going into the Canadian farm. Uh, and the bottom here, we have uh, a, live, a poultry operation from uh, a European country that has one of the most kind of productive uh, agriculture systems in the world, which is in the Netherlands. And you could think about all the uh, capital and the smart technology that goes into that. So uh, our economics and with looking at how, how does that production occur, um, what's motivating people to do the production they're doing. We have some kind of base questions about the economics of food production. Uh, what product should a farmer, if I as a farmer would produce in Alberta, I might think about, am I producing wheat or canola or hay? How much should I produce? So what proportion of my uh, farm should I use to produce that product? What inputs should I use? How much of them? Um, so that might be the land. How, uh, how much land am I going to own or rent for that? Um, how much fertilizer, what intensity and what type of fertilizer? Um, what type of seed, whether it's a, a treated seed, a certified seed or coated seed? Uh, what type of pesticides, whether that be insects, insecticides or herbicides or fungicides? And am I going to use uh, and what technology should I use? In, in Alberta, we might be thinking about uh, drones, for example. Where in Ethiopia, we might be thinking about, are, are we going to um, have a, a, you know, a two-wheeled device uh, to cultivate our land instead of to cultivating by hoe? So we're a variety of choices that farmers make. And uh, I know there are farmers here and people who work in agriculture who are making these choices all the time. There are extra questions which are kind of beyond our primary um, focus of production economics. Uh, more about marketing. When should I sell? Um, so the prices are fluctuating. I have to choose when to sell my product right from the field or do I store it and sell it later? Who should I sell it to? If I am an organic farmer, I might find that I can do direct marketing uh, through the internet sales. I can also sell, uh, I could, also sell at farmers markets or I can sell to some type of, of dealer. Um, on the financial side, two big things that farmers face every year is should they take out an operating loan or how, what should be the size of the loan? Who should they take their operating loan from? Uh, so operating loan allows them to buy all the inputs which are then invested for the year uh, before a return is reaped, you know, maybe 100 to 150 days later. Um, should I take out a capital loan so that I can buy new equipment or more land? Um, there's a resource here uh, from the North Dakota State University on production theory that I, that I recommend if you want more detail on, on production economics. So these decisions, especially just these fundamental decisions, depend upon, well, what is the objective of, of the farming operation? Uh, is, is it purely profit or something else? What are the actual input prices? Uh, so farmers mostly can observe those prices uh, with some clarity uh, at the beginning of the year. But as they're making their decisions, they know they're not going to pay, they're not going to sell their product. They're not going to have a product to sell um, for at least, say, three to four months, and they may not sell that product for another several months. So what prices might they get in the future? Um, 
They have to think about the transportation costs of moving uh, inputs to their farm or moving the product to market uh, and selling at different markets is important. That's very, very important for people who are trading in farmers, mar uh, at farmers markets, for example, is how far would they go? What are the technologies that are available and what technologies is a farmer used to and are com uh, a, a, um, acquainted with? Um, and an important thing about technologies is where can they get things serviced? For example, uh, that Canadian combine would not be able to be serviced in, in Ethiopia. Um, and then there's much that's beyond the control of farmer, the farmer. That's very important for agriculture. Uh, there are things like diseases, uh, uh, things like um, flu. Uh, avian flu is an important thing uh, affecting farmers in, in many parts of the world now. Or pests like grasshoppers um, that we are getting this year in Alberta. Or of course the weather, right? So different rainfalls, whether you have hail, uh, whether you get floods. Uh, Agriculture is an, it is an inherently risky uh, enterprise. And then what type of government support can you expect uh, if things don't pan out well? And, and governments are large supporters. I gave you that statistic the, the other day, about 40% of US income, farm income this year being from government support. We make assumptions as we did about the consumer. We're making assumptions. We want to predict people's behavior. Uh, we have to think, make assumptions. Um, we assume that farming is a business and the purpose is to make a profit. We'll relax that, we can relax that assumption later, but that's the starting assumption. We assume uh, that they want to uh, produce, that as they are profit motivated, they're going to produce the type and quantity of output that maximizes profits, so it maximizes their goal or their objective. Um, we think that they, we assume that they can increase the amount of output that they use by adding more inputs. So for example, adding more fertilizer, or adding more seed, but the, at a diminishing rate. As we have diminishing marginal utility from consumption, uh, consuming more and more stuff, uh, we assume also there's diminishing marginal returns from increase the amount of inputs we use. So if we put on one unit of fertilizer, we get a pretty big return. We put on the hundredth units of fertilizer, we get a relatively small return. We assume that farmers can use different combinations of inputs, or you might call it a different recipe to produce different outputs, um, or to produce, sorry, the same output. Uh, there are different recipes you can have. Um, and that the farmer accounts for all of the costs associated with their enterprise when they make their production decisions. And we're gonna see in a minute that we have to, re sometimes we have to relax that. So this is kind of the math, uh, thinking this through. So we had a math version of the consumer problem. This is the math version of the producer problem. The producer's objective is to maximize profits from producing and or transforming a food product. So there also, this holds for others in the supply chain, not just farmers. Uh, they're maximizing profits. So profit is defined as total revenue minus total cost, where revenue is uh, defined as the price of output times the quantity of output. So it may be the price of canola in dollars per bushel times the number of bushels that we um, produce and sell, minus the cost of each input times the quantity of, of that input. So if we have seed, fertilizer, and rent, a land rent, then we might have the price of seed times the quantity of seed, plus the price of fertilizer times the quantity of fertilizer, plus the, uh, the per acre land rental rate times the, the number of acres that we rent. That we might maximize that subject to, uh, for the consumer, we said subject to an income constraint. Here the subject to is a production function that relates the quantity of inputs to the quantities of outputs. Um, and the, in mathematical form, we have that Q Output equals a function of Q input one, so the quantity of one input, Q input two, the quantity of the second input and technology, plus the random factors like weather or pests that are beyond the control of the farmer. So this, and again, we assumed that um, more inputs produce more outputs, but at a diminishing marginal rate. Okay, um, when we do the math on that, so we take uh, we optimize that, uh, the profit function subject to that production constraint, uh, production function, 
we get the quantity supplied function at the bottom of the screen here. Quantity supplied, QS, is a function of the price of output, the price, sorry. Just gonna move things around. The price of inputs, uh, technology, um, and ad people's attitudes toward risk. So we know risk is important, um, so, but it, how you uh, respond to that rice risk depends on the attitude of the individual farmer. So we looked at that QS, uh, the result of that maximization problem. This is quantity supplied as a function of the price of output, the price of the inputs, the technology, the risk attitude. Uh, as we did for the demand function, if we hold the price of inputs, technology, and risks constant, then we can map a relationship between quantity supplied and price of output, which we do here. Uh, and that's what we call our supply function. Okay. Sorry. Just going to move this around. Okay. So how might we have refinements on that? As we had refinements for consumer theory, the refinements for producer theory, uh, there might be large differences. So we first assume that uh, farmers know the technology, they can apply the technology fully, they get a return based on their technology and, and some random variable depending on weather. What we see in practice is many farmers are very inefficient in their use of inputs uh, so that, it, uh, that, that inefficiency is extra costs that they're not having recovered. Um, also being inefficient means that there's waste that might have to be handled some other way. The second key thing is that far, not, farmers don't, may not bear all of the costs associated with their production. So for example, uh, a uh, farming practice which cultivates a grassland will degrade a wildlife habitat as we have an example of, of lots of clearing and cultivation of land like these grasslands in Southern Alberta, which is a habitat for the endangered prong, pronghorn antelope. Um, so they may not, farmers may not take that cost into account. They may not take into account the carbon emissions associated with their, with their energy use or with their land clearing. They may not account for the uh, pollution, uh, air pollution through um, fine particulate matter or carbon pollution associated with their operation. They may not take account of the cost of, of solid waste um, that um, that they their enterprise generates or human health costs of their operations. Um, so here is an example uh, in the bottom left hand corner of a hog farm in North Carolina that has a manure lagoon. Uh, there's due to the hurricane there was a breach of the lagoon and release of that um, that water. Uh, downstream in and that affects down uh, the health of people downstream. Um, farmers equally may not gain from some of the benefits associated with the production. Uh, so there are production practices that are very good for carbon sequestration like uh, this grassland or certain types of conservation agriculture. There may be scenic value as there is associated with their agriculture as there is, there is with this grassland or the food security value that the whole society benefits from. Okay, so I'm going to stop here uh, and and share, stop sharing my screen and take a pause for the next lecture. <laughs>